Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farming, it's all good. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy. Local foods took center stage at this year's State Fair of Virginia. What to do with Thanksgiving leftovers? How about a homemade turkey pot pie? And thousands of Virginia school children visit the state's largest outdoor classroom every year. Welcome back everyone. We're here at Meadow Event Park, which of course is the site of the State Fair of Virginia, which is just wrapped. And as you can see, they're tearing down the midway behind me. And folks had an opportunity to come to the fair this year to celebrate Virginia's largest industry. But as Norm Hyde reports, there was also particular interest in local foods. Visitors to this year's fair had a chance to take home local meats, produce, pumpkins, and flowers from an on-site farmer's market on the weekends. Farmer's markets were also on the agenda when the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture visited to announce more than a million dollars in grants for Virginia's local food movement. Uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of farmer's markets in the last five years. In fact, a 76 uh, percent increase. There are now uh, over 8,200 farmers markets throughout the United States. Uh, today, uh, we're announcing uh, uh, additional resources uh, for farmers markets, uh, the ability to, to uh, take money uh, to promote, uh, to expand marketing opportunities for farmers markets. The secretary was making his first visit to the State Fair of Virginia and praised folks on how they told agriculture's story. The federal grants he announced were part of a $52 million national package to promote all manner of local food initiatives, including efforts to make it easier for commercial vendors to buy local. We're going to see about $1.1 million uh, coming into Virginia, uh, Governor, to uh, fund 18 separate projects, in local uh, food production and promotion, uh, farmers markets promotion. Uh, the local food marketing promotion program is really designed to create food hubs. We talked to the First Lady about this earlier today about the need to aggregate this locally produced food so it can be sold to institutional purchasers. Vilsack also announced funding for organic foods research and production nationwide, along with efforts to support urban agriculture programs and even startup funds for a few individual local food producers. But once you have local foods, how do you cook them to make delicious meals? Leave that up to Chef Jeff. Jeff Henderson, who brought his Flip My Food truck and a television production crew to the fair to highlight Virginia dishes. Flip My Food is a nationally syndicated cooking show. Henderson invited former Miss State Fair Virginia and the current Miss Virginia Courtney Garrett into his food truck kitchen, along with Blue Ribbon Award winner Suzyette Jackson and Emma Helm, a 4-H volunteer and former 4-H student. Henderson says there's no doubt that locally sourced foods are popular with the public and chefs across the nation. I, th I think today a lot of the food trends now our people are going back to the farms, and it is a movement across the country. And I, I think the more folks, uh, chefs that build relationships with the farmers, the farmers are able to produce the product that home cooks and restaurant chefs need. Henderson says even before he was a television chef, he reached out to meet local farmers and that today's cooking experts value those relationships with their suppliers. Go talk to the farmer. You know, there's a saying down in Louisiana, know your farmer, know your food. So get out in the car, go through the countryside, and when you see open spaces of land and you see corn being grown, you see the pecan trees and whatnot, pull over, build those relationships. Chef Jeff's recipes included minestrone, Brunswick stew, and pickled products in a seafood dish. Each featured lower fat ingredients that made the meals healthier while keeping traditional tastes. Whether visitors were buying it, politicians were supporting it, or chefs were cooking it, local foods were on display along with all of the other great Virginia foods at this year's State Fair of Virginia. In Caroline County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. I'm Mark Viet. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about how you can fill your garden with thousands, even millions of plants at little or almost no cost. Stay with us. I work Vander High Dairy Incorporated. Me and my parents and my two other brothers own the farm. We farm about 2,000 acres. 
We currently milk about 1,100 cows three times a day. Total animals on the farm are about 2,500. We do a lot of tours here and we constantly try to educate as much as we can about what we do. I would like the consumer to know how much care goes into the production of each gallon of milk. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to ensure the quality of that milk, to ensure that the animals are treated well. I'd rather do this than anything else. I don't even like going on vacation because why go on vacation when you're already doing something you love? I'm Roy Vanderheide, a first generation dairy farmer from Virginia, and I'm dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and my land. For most gardeners, this growing season is coming to an end, but as Mark Viette tells us, this is the perfect time to gather seeds for next year in the garden. Throughout the year, you can collect your own seed right out of your own garden. You can take these seeds and then over the winter or next year, you can germinate them, maybe right in the garden, or you can germinate them indoors like you would your vegetables, and you can end up with thousands and thousands of plants. And for example, here, we will take our shears, and on your peonies, you almost need to harvest them before the peony stems lay open or lay over, and you just come in here like this, and you need some kind of a tray. You keep them upright till you're ready, and Pretty much, you can see all the peony seeds right here, ready to be planted in the fall. One of my favorite plants to collect seed from is known as wild indigo. Used to be used as a dye many years ago. They come available in blue. This is known as Baptisia australis. It's the blue wild indigo. But now they have white flowered forms, yellow flowered forms, and they're easy to propagate on your own. So all you'll do is when, and again, you can hear the seed, that the seed is definitely ripe, and you want to collect this before these little pods begin to break open. And they're just beginning to break open. So what I like to do is just go through in the garden and by hand, gently, prune and you might want to prune a couple uh, you know basketfuls or a couple handfuls of this. Eudechia or black-eyed Susan can be divided in the spring but if I want to produce lots of them I'm going to harvest the seed and it's easy to do. What you're going to want to do is first of all look at the flowers and make sure that they're harvested at the correct point in time. This here is not quite ready yet. On Rudbeckias, you want to wait till these petals wither away like what you see here. These are perfect to be harvested. One of my favorite flowers, hollyhocks, it's a biannual. It grows the first year and then it blooms either later that year or the following year. Easy to just go ahead. This is one you do more by hand and you take the seed pods and then you just sort of like crush the seed pods. You can then blow away the old debris because you really don't want to store the debris. And as you get some of the uh, seed pods with, with you know more mature seed, they pretty much come out just on their own, just like this. So you gently use your fingers to remove the seed and then once you're done, you can take the seed and store it in Ziploc bags. A lot of seed we store in the refrigerator. It really depends on what you want to do. And then here you have your seed. And imagine if you collected all the seed, this would probably be half filled with hollyhocks. Another one that we'll do that we've harvested is the Baptisia. This one's a little different. Take a paper bag. Then you go ahead and you're going to take your seed pods and set them in the paper bag. Not all of them at once, like this. And then you're going to take them 
and you're gonna and when you're done you have all your seed ready to be stored stick it in the fridge and seed it out in the garden in the spring or with many of these seeds I could scratch them in the surface after November so the seed does not come up till spring and I can fill my garden with all these blooming blues and pinks and purple plants. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to indagardenradio.com. If you're tired of turkey sandwiches for the week following Thanksgiving, we have a recipe for you. Stay with us. Dazzling lights on winter nights will put you in the mood for the holiday season. It's the Illuminate Light Show in Santa's Village at the Meadow Event Park November 14th through January 3rd in Caroline County. The spectacular drive through holiday lighting event takes travelers through a musical show of color, lights, and design. Giant animated holiday displays and illuminated trees lead to Santa's Village where families can visit Santa Claus and enjoy the sights and magic of Christmas. To learn more, go to IlluminateLightShow.com. What do you do with the leftovers from Thanksgiving dinner? Former Miss America Carissa Jackson shows us a recipe for homemade turkey pot pie in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Caressa Jackson with Heart of the Home, and today I'm cooking at the kitchen at the Meadow Event Park. So it's November, it's after Thanksgiving, and we're wondering, what are we going to do with all of the rest of that turkey? You can't eat another regular Thanksgiving plate, right? So today I've decided to make a double-crusted turkey pot pie. It's a spin on your chicken pot pies, or some people do like beef or pork pot pies, um, but this is going to be using turkey. And so for our ingredients, we have tea, uh, two tablespoons of butter, we have one half chopped onion. We have two stalks of celery. We have about two sticks of carrots, four tablespoons of flour, and four cups of chicken or turkey stock, whatever you have. And then you can use one to two potatoes, um, and that will work for our base of this recipe. One of the first things that you want to do is pre-bake your deep dish uh, pie crust. You can do that for about 10 minutes on 350. This just ensures that once we add all of the ingredients that we don't have a doughy crust um, when we finish it. So the first thing that we're going to do with this recipe is we are going to add our two pieces of butter here and melt it on the bottom of a saucepan. And then we are going to add our onions to it to brown. And you want to cook this on medium heat. For about one minute. And then we're going to add our celery and our carrots. The wonderful thing about this dish is a lot of these things you might still have extra of with your Thanksgiving meal. I know I always have extra carrots, I have extra potatoes. Um, so this almost is like one of those catch-all dishes that you can use all of your leftovers at one time without having to waste anything. We're gonna let this simmer for about three minutes and then we will add our flour and we'll add our chicken stock. All right, so now it's time for us to add our four tablespoons of flour and our four cups of chicken or turkey stock. Mix that around just a little bit and then we're going to add our potatoes and we're gonna bring this to a boil so that they can tender. So with whatever turkey pieces that you have left, you can just shred them by hand. That's my favorite way to do it. Um, and we're also gonna add that in one cup of frozen peas. Um, and we will add this to our recipe. And one of the great things about turkey is that it is, um, well, poultry rather, is one of the number one commodities in the state of Virginia. And so we put turkeys all over the country during Thanksgiving, but it's great to have them right here at home. So we're just going to 
peel these pieces off with our hands. You can use turkey breast, you can use pieces of the leg, really any part um, of leftover turkey that you have is fair game, except for the bones. All right, and we will add our peas first. And then our turkey. This is about two cups of shredded turkey. Just as a note, if you tend to like your broth or your mixture a little thicker, at any point you can add some more flour just to thicken it up the same way you would if you were making a gravy. And we're gonna let this simmer for about 10 minutes. So now our mixture is thickened up a bit and we can go ahead and add it to our pie crust. Instead of just pouring it all in there, I like to spoon mine in so that I make sure I get a lot of the ingredients in there that's not just um, the broth or the thick gravy. We wanna make sure we're getting turkey and potatoes and peas and carrots, all the good stuff. There's a possibility that you'll have a lot left over, which is fine. This is one of those great recipes that you can freeze in a freezer safe bag um, and use as the winter time gets cold. It's a quick and easy meal. Just thaw out um, the mixture and you can make another pot pie. All right, you wanna get almost full, but not too full because as it continues to cook in the oven, it's gonna bubble up a bit and the top crust that we put on top is going to create a nice crown and we wanna make sure that there is room for that. So as you see here, I have one egg lightly beaten. We're going to use that um, to brush on top of our pie crust. You can get one of these um, ready-baked pie crust at your local supermarket. And we're just going to lay it on top. Press down the sides. You can pinch if you like. And then we're going to pull off just a little bit of the excess. Not too much because the good thing about Popeyes is you like to have the crust that goes over. And we're going to take our egg. And this works if you have a kitchen paintbrush as well. And you wanna do it right in the center of the pie crust. You don't have to do it on the edges because the edges are gonna flake up and get nice and brown on their own. All right, and we are going to put this in the oven for about 30 minutes. All right, we've taken our pot pie out of the oven and we've let it cool and I have sliced a piece so that you can see all of the wonderful ingredients on the inside. This makes for a great fall dish. This is double crusted turkey pot pie. I'm Caressa Jackson for Heart of the Home. Come and get it. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia's Shenandoah Valley is often called the turkey capital of the U.S. since the modern turkey industry was founded there in 1922. Previously, farmers had to round up their turkey flocks like cattle and herd them to the market, making it more difficult to provide a consistent supply of birds. Virginia is now the sixth largest turkey producing state in the nation with more than 5.1 million birds on 663 farms. The turkey industry is a major part of the overall $8 billion poultry sector. And turkey is popular overseas as well. About 12% of U.S. turkey products are exported. We all want healthy rivers and streams, but we can't do that without help from Virginia's landowners. Resource Management Plans, or RMPs, are part of a voluntary program that helps farmers get credit for cleaning up our waters. And once you have an RMP, you are exempt from any new water quality requirements for nine years. The Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation has funds available to help you implement these plans. Contact the department today to learn more. Thank you. This message sponsored by Virginia's Agriculture Community.
It may be one of the best days students spend in the classroom, an outdoor classroom that is. Dave Miller shows us the benefits for both students and teachers at the Educational Expo at the State Fair of Virginia. It isn't every day students get to visit the state's largest outdoor classroom, but busloads of children from elementary to high school visit the State Fair of Virginia each year to do just that. The fair has put together an education exposition for the last 25 years, giving approximately 10,000 students across the state a chance to learn about Virginia's largest industry and experience lessons geared toward the state's standards of learning. The experience of the State Fair, they come, they learn, they have a good time, and that's part of the State Fair. But the educational part is just so very worthwhile. The, there are so many that young people who are from urban areas see things they have never seen before, between the animals, the horticulture, the agriculture, and that the children or the students who are from more of the rural parts of the state see the importance of what their community is about and what their families do and what they learn about. So we cover a full gamut of educational opportunities. We brought our sixth grade students and we were the math teachers that organized the trip. So we made math type activities and we just study ratios for one thing. So they have to find out like the ratio of boys to girls in their group and then the ratio of cow uh, cows to uh, calves and chickens to ducks and all, all kinds of things. Students at the fair always enjoy looking at the different animals. Sometimes they even have the opportunity to watch a live calf being born at the Dairy Birthing Barn. The many exhibits and live demonstrations make learning fun and a great adventure. It's a wonderful opportunity for school groups from all over the state, and I do mean all over the state because we get them from all over the state, to come. We have the SOLs in the field trip planning so the teachers can plan ahead because we do zero in on the SOLs so these teachers can fulfill a lot of the SOLs that are there, the natural resources, heritage vision, village, and of course the wonderful agriculture part of the state fair. Our student body draws from a very like high density uh, suburban area. We're in Prince William County outside of Washington and I would bet a lot of these students have never seen farm, have seen farm animals up close before. I heard a lot of comments when we walked in here about the smell, and I'm thinking, this is nothing, you know? <laughs> they probably have no idea that their food starts someplace other than the grocery store, and to be able to see it here and see how things are grown and how animals are raised and where milk comes from, and, you know, that's gotta be a great experience for them. Young McDonald's Farm is one of 15 educational exhibits at the fair. Other stops include forestry and natural resources, as well as peanuts, tobacco, cotton, and honey. Just about every farm commodity grown in Virginia has an exhibit at the fair. Students get to see poultry and livestock, as well as amazing examples of horticulture, including a giant pumpkin weighing more than 1,200 pounds. It's a day out of the classroom to enjoy learning about agriculture while making fond new memories. Teachers can start booking their trip each summer on the fair's website. From Caroline County, this is Dave Miller reporting. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we're proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia.